Hello, hello. Good morning, everyone. How you doing, Simos? Good morning, REC Nation. Good morning, Jazz. Good morning, Good morning. everyone from every corner of the nation. I'm seeing North York. I'm seeing Vancouver. I'm seeing everything every time. It feels so nice. I want to welcome everyone that is uh, live here on the webinar with us, live on YouTube, live on Facebook, live on Instagram. And not only do we have people, as I mentioned, as you mentioned, Simos, from right across the nation, but we have people right across the world. And so we really want to thank everyone who's joining us and welcome also our new friends uh, that are watching from, uh, uh, sorry, that signed in from the Right Club. We have the co-founder of the Right Club, the one and only Sarah Larby. How are you doing today, Sarah? Do we got- I'm doing what? awesome. Thanks so much for having me on. I'm excited. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning. How are you? Good, good. You're, wait, when you go quiet, it goes really quiet. Almost like it's, it's <laughs> off. So you threw me off. I don't hear any static or or anything of the sort. That's funny. I'm super excited to be on, guys. <clears throat> yeah, I love your show, and uh, you know, you bring great energy. Well, we're 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 very happy. We've been doing this for almost uh, coming up to ten weeks now, and for anyone who has not. Uh, or was not on on our past brunches just go to our youtube page it's youtube.com forward slash rec experience if you scroll down you'll see a playlist with all of our past brunches um and and if you wanted to see the recording of this again um because there's going to be a lot of nuggets being dropped throughout this uh, conversation in this brunch today. Make sure to go back, um, have a watch, have a listen, and uh, uh, and we'll make sure that we can, we'll tell you how to get in touch with everyone that uh, we've spoken to in the past and also Sarah and, and, and how to get connected with the right club. Sarah, just for our viewers right now, like I'm a big, all, all, all my viewers right now know that I'm a big comic book fan. Like I'm an incredible Hulk, Iron Man, and I love origin stories. And I love how people kind of got started and their backstory. Talk to, talk to us a little bit about um, how the Right Club got formed. What is the Right Club for all of our viewers and listeners that don't know, uh, uh, don't know anything about the Right Club. So talk to us a little bit about that, girl. Um, I club about three and a half years ago, um, Daniel St. Jean, Alfonso Salemi, um, and then back in the day, there was actually a, a fourth separate person that ended up moving back to uh, Nova Scotia, and Laurel Simmons joined uh, Daniel's wife. But we, uh, we just wanted to have a group for, you know, education purposes that was starting to meet in Burlington. There was nothing um, out that way at the time. And we just really wanted to give back to the community. And, you know, fast forward to, I guess, you know, when we had our last meeting, like we were having meetings with 300 people. I think the, the biggest one was about three, 350 um, prior to COVID. And then, and then we started taking some stuff online. So we're going more online, but we just really wanted to be able to educate investors and provide um, networking opportunities. Cause they say, right, your, your network is your net worth. And so that's essentially how it founded uh, back. I, I want to say we started in March of three years ago in our first event, we actually had a hundred people. Um, and it really just grew organically from there. So, um, and by the way, Right Club is how you pronounce it. It stands for Real Estate Investing Training and Education. Love it. Um, and and uh, Tyler, make sure that we 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 put the links here um, on how to get more information. And and obviously, Sarah, you'll make mention of it a little later on as well. You know, uh, between myself and Seamus, like we've had the opportunity to sit down with a lot of newbie investors, seasoned investors and we tell them all the time like your net worth is determined by your network okay and as you mentioned as well sarah but a lot of people i find and i would love to kind of get both of your takes on this i find that a lot of people who, who who are starting out are scared to go to meetups or they're they're worried they're concerned i've always said 
the nicest people in the world are real estate investors because we all like to talk <laughs> about our stories. We like to talk about our successes. We like to talk about our failures so other people don't hit their heads on the, uh, you know, we've hit our heads against the wall. So, so, so somebody else hopefully doesn't have to. Like, have you found that as well, Sarah? Like people are just timid at times. And, and, and what would be your tips and advice for somebody who would be like, well, I'm an introvert. There's no way I want to go into a room of a hundred people. I know it, it can seem scary. I, so I will say though, that, you know, when I first started investing in real estate, I didn't know that investors were so nice. I thought they would be like, why are you trying to take my deal? Or I'm not going to tell you my information. Um, you know, when I first started real estate investing, it was literally, I, I figured out uh, big, the Bigger Pockets podcast back in the day and I started reading some American books and I didn't even know that there was a big difference between Canada and the US. Um, and then the first uh, networking event, I believe it was Rain back in the day. Right. Acre, and uh, and then I, I started making some connections that way. Um, you know, I think, yeah, absolutely. Like I've never been like a pro at networking when I first started, you get used to it over time. Um, but, you know, ask questions, like seem interested in other people, ask them about what they're doing. People do like talking about themselves. I mean, we probably all do like talking about ourselves and sharing information. And that is really how I find most investors that are successful do want to share, which is really cool. Um, introduce yourself and start asking questions about them. And, uh, you know, and I think, I think over time you go to the same events over and over and you're going to start seeing the same people and then you're, they're going to become, you know, some of your good friends. Like when I look at my top five today, right, they say you're the average of the five people you hang out with most. They're actually all investors at this point, which is kind of ironic. Um, and most of them actually from the right club and they've been regular attendees and they're some of my best friends at this point, which is really cool. I mean, I still have friends from, from prior, but the people that I hang out with the most now <laughs> are, are people from, you know, the networking events. So that, that is pretty cool. So Sarah, I, I've been to the right club. I've actually been to three or four meetings at this point. Uh, and I will give you some feedback where uh, I've never been to a different networking event that has that type of culture. Uh, and I think what makes your, your, your guys' organization uh, uh, different and unique from anywhere else is the culture of uh, every investor can share what they're doing. So it's not a marketing, a, a place where you're selling something. Mm -hmm. It's a place where people actually network their own ideas, their, their business, uh, what they're doing and, and what they're looking for. So you have any person in the room with any agenda, you don't know what they're going to say. It's not a prepped, uh, scripted uh, meetup. It's, so it's, it's very genuine and you have guys who just started and you have, uh, I, I, I have seen many people that I know extremely well uh, at your meetup uh, that have been clients of ours for like a decade and or avid investors for 20 years. And they're all sharing that information and they're all meeting together and in, in and kind of having that coffee and that evening of, of uh, sharing their passion and knowledge. So I do give big kudos to your organization. You have something very unique. Um, and and uh, I, I, I hope to God that COVID doesn't kill that vibe. Uh, if it all goes, like, not that there's anything wrong with online, we're online right now and it's good, but it's not the same. It's not the same as sharing a room and the energy uh, that that creates with people. So I do hope that we get back to, to, to our old normal uh, soon because uh, it, it, it's definitely an experience that I would recommend to so many people. It's a great, yeah, it's just a great environment. Absolutely. You know, and we've been, we've been doing a lot of online stuff um, and it's about the community. And I think <coughs> that is the biggest thing is, you know, and my biggest pet peeve is you go somewhere and you get sold on something, right? They give you just a little bit of information, but they don't give you any concrete stuff. And then, Oh, you want to buy this? You have to pay a thousand bucks and then they go to the thousand dollar one. Oh, you actually want to know the actual information you got to pay. To I'm, I'm like allergic. Like it's ironic because I'm in sales, but I don't do this kind of sale. And when I go to a networking event and they're just upselling, it just actually just irritates me. Um, so I think that's why we've actually been really successful. There's nothing against selling, but you go to some of these events and you know that they're like just out there to pitch you and they're not giving you any concrete information or anything that, that can apply. And that's the stuff that um, I don't like and I don't want our club to represent. So our club is not about us. And as you'll see, like we, we host the overall event, but usually the majority of the time we're not actually presenting. Um, if I can find somebody that's amazing in student rentals, I mean, I don't do student rentals, right? So 
I will find, or we will find the best person for that, so that we can bring in front of our audience to share tips and like actual concrete data. And I think that's why our club's done really well is just because it's not about us. It's about the right club nation and, and our members. For everyone who's watching, make sure that any and all questions go into the Q&A section. Um, between the three of us, we will do our best to, to get to all of the questions, our past brunch. We got so many questions over these uh, brunches that we had to do a, uh, 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 a Q&A only brunch last Saturday, because sometimes Simos and I, um, as we mentioned, we like to talk and talk and talk and talk. And so, and so sometimes we don't get to all the questions. We do apologize. Um, but uh, make sure to go back to the past brunch. And But if you leave your questions in the Q&A section, we will do our best. You're also a fellow podcaster, girl. I love the podcast. What made you hey. start it? What's the name of it? So people can get to it and listen to it while you're taking your dog for a walk on the treadmill. Um, uh, what, like, what got you started in doing the podcast? How has it been beneficial for you? And uh, where can people hear it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it's funny because you and I, I was I was telling you this the other day when I was on your Instagram show, we have some of the same motto, right? And for me, uh, maybe this is a good thing, but I'm not a perfectionist. You know, good, good is, is, you know, is what I want. Something that's good enough and done. So I like to get stuff done. And then if it's not perfect, that's okay. So that whole ready, fire, aim on your sign, that's like my favorite sign. I want one actually made like that but I think that's why I'm here today is I don't overanalyze anything like I analyze it and then like okay I'm going to take some action on it and see what happens and then you tweet so how the podcast came about so one is called where should I invest um, and then the other one is called the right club podcast because we we did a podcast for a club and literally I don't know if you guys were there at the uh the wealth forum where Tony Robbins and Pitbull was there like three years ago and they had this big event and one of the breakout sessions, that was a pitch session. Like that whole thing was a pitch thing, but it was, you know, regardless, it was good networking. And <laughs> one of the, but we, it, were actually, we were actually supposed to be there, Jess. We had tickets. <laughs> we never I made mean, it, Anthony, but Anthony it, it was Robinson. right at front, front and Young Street, right? It was at the, what is it called? Yeah. Metro, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, lo I loved it. Like the energy was awesome, but like there wasn't a whole lot of stuff that you get from just listening in a crowd of like 10,000 people, right? But, but you would find um, ways was, to spend a lot of money if you wanted to. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know what? I, so I bought this, this podcasting course. So there was a breakout session and the guy was talking about podcasting and I almost actually decided to walk out of that room and go to another session, but for whatever, because I didn't know what it was about. And I'm like, oh, podcasting. And then I, I ended up just buying it. And then I'm, I said, okay, well, I bought the course. I'm just going to go start a podcast. And my first few were just like horrible. Like <laughs> I'm scared to listen to them again because the I was doing them on the phone. Like I had this like app that was like recording and I was like speaking on it. It wasn't even done properly. Anyways, you know, that was three years ago. It's still not like a hundred percent now. It's okay. Um, but you know, it, it's like that step in that direction. And then you do a little bit more and then you get better over time. Um, so, you know, today I've got one releasing a week. I've got, you know, some amazing guests on the podcast sharing some great knowledge. Like it's actually super fun to do. Now, look, it's actually a good segue because I've been getting really loud and Seamus has been getting really loud about, about investors producing content, getting, speaking, start speaking to the world, putting out the fact that you are an investor. What would you say? And what kind of, again, what's, what's some tips and strategies? And well, let's start off. Why do you think it, it's important for an investor to produce content? Well, here's the, here's the thing. Because of the podcast, I probably get two emails a week for JVs, potential JVs. I think like, so for me, it was really important for me to build my own portfolio first, where I have a hundred percent autonomy, where I have a hundred percent. If I want to keep it for 30 years, if I want to refinance, if I want to sell, okay. um, you know, I think it was important to build my own portfolio for that long-term piece. Um, but I will tell you the podcast has brought many people from Vancouver, from the U S that, that want to invest and they want to have somebody that they can trust because I'm they're hearing me every single week because they're seeing me on stages or at different events. They feel like in a way, I'm not just like here one day and gone the next. Right. So it, I think it helps build a little bit of that trust. Cause sometimes I'll talk to people and they're like, I feel like I know you and like we're friends. I'm like, that's cool. You know? Um, but I think that's the, the biggest opportunity is, and if it's not a podcast, because podcasts take a long time, 
you know, start put posting your information, what you're doing on Instagram or social media. Um, and, uh, and sometimes you'll have people reach out to you by just asking you certain questions and you can make connections that way. Um, I mean, a lot of people are doing that and you are seeing the results instantly. Like the, just the, like, I know so many of our clients that are now sharing their stories uh, in creating that, that taking those pictures in front of the new income property they just bought and following the renovations. Uh, and I'm sorry, th that's going to create traction where somebody's going to be like, okay, that person's done that before. That person has experience with excavating and, and fixing drainage issues and evaluating opportunity. So yeah. I, I think it's fantastic. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah no, I mean, no. Go ahead, Sarah. I, I was just going to say when I first started the podcast, it wasn't, I wasn't even thinking that far ahead. Like literally, like, I'm just like, I'm just going to take action on it and see what happens and throw a bunch of stuff. But I wasn't thinking, okay, it was going to bring me these opportunities. It was going to bring me, um, you know, JV opportunities or people that want to invest their money and hold the financing as an example. And, and for me, just as important, it's just as important for me to find the right JV partner as them to find the right JV partner, right? It's a two-way street because it's, it's like a marriage. Um, yeah. I started the podcast, but you know, at the end of the day, the reason I started the podcast is I'm like, there's not a whole lot of Canadian content back three years ago. And there's a whole lot of differences between the U.S. and Canada. And that's really just why I wanted to do it. Um, but, you know, it, so if it's not JVs, I, there could be other, the other things that come your way just by posting things and showing that you've got, you know, the, the experience that you're, you're taking action and doing things. Oh, but I'll give a I'm big a shout out to John. Sorry, sorry, Jazz. Uh, just go ahead, Canadian buddy. content versus American. Uh, I'll give a huge shout out to Don Campbell, who was the trailblazer and pioneer of, yes. of really putting out the message to Canadians that this stuff can be done, should be done uh, to safeguard your future and build real wealth. His books are still an invaluable source to me uh, and to many Canadians. So I, I think, uh, again, standing on the shoulders of, of work done before us, uh, of, of men like Don Campbell and his organization. I don't know exactly where Rain is at today. I think they've had, they've gone through many different paths. I don't think they're the same organization they used to be uh, mm -hmm. for better or for worse. Like I'm not, I'm, I just haven't followed it that closely. Uh, but I mean, it's still a very significant organization in the Canadian marketplace. But like that, that's who started that whole Canadian content. And, and yeah. looking back to like, for example, what you've done, and I know what we do, I know the amount of content we put out to Canadian investors specifically. Yeah, you guys do an awesome job. It, it, it's, you have a source, there's sources now for the Canadian investor to go and get the help, to get the inspiration, to say that, okay, well, maybe I'm in North Manitoba, but if I make a phone call or if I shoot an email to someone, someone's going to respond and give me legit advice on how to structure my portfolio in Manitoba. Mm -hmm. So there's greatness out there, guys. There's greatness out yeah. there. So why, why real estate for you, Sarah? What, 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 uh, like what got you into real estate? Why, why did you want to start investing into real estate specifically? Because you could have you know, obviously chosen other type of, types of investments, i.e. businesses, um, stocks, mutual funds. But uh, what attracted you to real estate? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know what? It, it is a funny story, but for whatever reason, like I just never wanted to work 30 years in my life. I wanted to get enough wealth and find a way to live passively. Um, but prior to that, you know, and some people have heard this story before, but I went to TD Bank and the financial advisor asked us what our liabilities and our assets were. And we had been working our jobs for a few years. And literally I'm like, what's the asset? And what's a liability? Like, I, like literally you guys are still, like, <laughs> further ahead. What's these like, words you're <laughs> using? <laughs> so I didn't even know that. So like, it was actually like a good wake up call to be like, okay, so I'm, I'm working, but where is my money even going? And all I'm doing is spending it on stuff. And so I started Googling what an asset and the liability was. And I'm like, you know what, what is you know, how, what is the best way to create wealth? And they, and jazz, like there is, you know, businesses there, there is the stock market. Um, and then there was real estate, the business piece again, felt like a whole full-time thing. And the investing thing, you know what? I was actually a financial, I, I did my LLQP license. I was a financial advisor for like three months and I'm like, this sucks. <laughs> 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 um, for many you were stuck behind the desk. 
you were stuck behind the desk. I'm sure that, that that's not what you wanted to do. <laughs> I was in sales. So I was selling like mutual funds and that kind of stuff. But I'm like, I want you, like I wanted my clients to be able to take control and do their own investing. Because when you uh, put somebody into the mutual fund, like they're, they're paying like 3.5 MER fees, like mutual, uh, the management expense ratio fee. And I'm like, you could do better just doing it yourself. And I, and I, I would have made absolutely no money the way that it was structured for me if I advise that. So I'm like, I can't do this. This is just like against all my, my values and not, and, and I'm, please like people don't be offended. It's just, I really like to teach people how to do it themselves uh, as much as possible. Right. So that they don't need somebody else and they can create their own thing. So then I, I ended that and I, I went back to the job world and uh, I just kept researching, literally Googling and Googling. And then real estate was just like, okay, you know, this, this seems not the worst case scenario. I've already tried the stocks, the mutual fund thing. I, I don't really think it's for me. It's not as much control as, as I would like. And then there was convincing my spouse uh, to uh, go ahead and uh, buy our first one. So that took a couple of years. <laughs> so the <laughs> property was in 2013. Great idea. I promise. I promise. <laughs> He was, um, so he was scared of just having like a horrible tenant that trashes the place and doesn't pay and that kind of stuff. Um, he's a police officer. Clearly he sees the worst of the worst and he deals with a lot of that. So granted his, for our first, our first, uh, renter was his sister. We saved, I didn't even know like anything other than, oh, people have to save 20% for this. So like literally I would cash out and, you know, in hindsight, it was probably the best thing I've ever done anyways, cause you learn, um, by doing, but I, I scraped together 20% and bought the cheapest thing I could afford. I think it was a hundred and thirty thousand um, dollar house from the 1850s. Somehow it still stands today. And so, and then we had a sister that needed to move closer, so she she was our tenant. And I'm like, how much can you afford? And she's like, well, this is what I can afford. I'm like, okay. And I gave her like a hundred dollars discount from what she said. And <laughs> in hindsight, we could have gotten like three four hundred dollars more because that was market rent. Like literally, we knew nothing. Um, just enough to take action. And, uh, and so that's how it started. And then because he was worried about um, tenants moving forward, and I'm like, we really need to build a portfolio. We're not gonna get rich off one house. We're not gonna get rich off two houses. Like we need to, we need to build this. So in the beginning, what I started doing was finding the tenants before I found the property. So the second house we had, the tenants picked out and had looked around based on their criteria with them. And then found two houses and they we actually met them when we're like can you pick between these two houses they're still there to this day they so are the you have the tenant picking the property talk about reverse engineering <laughs> and building to suit how smart I will say though, how creative i will say it's creative but i will say it's not the best strategy because in ontario because we're we're, we're rent control I know because we're rent controlled and they're still in the property. I'll, I will tell you, they are like the best tenants in the world. Um, we had like squirrels in the attic. She literally like called three companies, negotiated with one of them. Like they're so good because they feel like it's like their home. Um, but in hindsight, she like, if they moved out, I could up that market rents another 500 bucks. So then it's like, you know, at some point you, you kind of wake up and you're like, this is probably not the best situation. So the, the rest of the properties, we did it differently. Um, now I have a whole different screening process, which literally one of the questions is how, you know, what was your plan with for this house? How long do you want to live there? And I look for that two to five year timeline of somebody that wants to buy a house at some point because I can't have lifers. Some people love them um, in Ontario for me in a house that's built prior to 2018. Um, when Ford, uh, re, you know, removed anything um, past that, I think it was November of 2018, is no longer yep. subject to rent control. But anything prior is so, you know, they have to move out within two to five years, and it's hard to, as you know, to you know ask people to leave. So they have to do it likely on their own, and then you get back to market. Anyways, that was, no. I guess, that was a really long answer to your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's awesome. No, it's awesome. That's what, we're having brunch. Simos, what are you eating over there? What are you having for yeah, brunch? So, so first and foremost, I'm the guy putting the brunch back in the brunch. It, it, right. I, I know. I, I don't see any pain. Nobody's talking about it. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I'm having uh, a scrambled egg, uh, a piece of uh, a piece of toast, strawberries, bananas, raspberries, drizzled with a little honey. From the motherland. Love it. From the motherland, from the motherland of Greece. I love it. Oh. I love that oil. Thanks for giving me some oil in the uh, past. Cheers. Nice. Uh, Jazzy, I <laughs> want to touch on something before we move to another subject. I know you took the long route, Sarah. 
but I, I have a lot of experience with multifam and with tenants in Ontario and with, uh, we have an eightplex downtown uh, right close to uh, Ryerson University. Uh, and we, we got, it's a joint venture. Uh, it's ourselves and five other partners. And we've had, uh, we flipped half the building since we bought mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. But in five years, we still have four original tenancies. The rents have literally gone up 140% in the downtown C1 sector. This is just, the time, just outside of uh, C1. It's in my, just under Moss Park. But I'm telling you, it's, it's not an easy business. You do need the flip if you want to make the numbers work. Yeah. There are many strategies that we can take. Um, I want today to really focus on something you mentioned before. So I think uh, we can easily, uh, the REC uh, can easily share those uh, flip uh, tenant strategies without Sarah here. Uh, with Sarah here, I really want you to go down some of the financing because you said earlier, oh, I always thought I needed 20% to get an investment property. That is still the number one delusion in our audience, our audience. And we've said it a hundred times, but I want you to use your words to explain how does financing break down? How does one not use 20% to get an investment property? And I want you to go down your mindset and your uh, train of your strategy. How do you do it? What do you do? Yeah, well, I'll tell, I'll tell you how I got to 10 properties, 12 units, yes. um, basically, you know, myself without any JVs. After the first one, um, you know, the second one, we, we did kind of similar. And then we realized that there's a way to use equity in a property. And when you can use the equity in the property, you're technically using the bank's money at their own game. So let's just say you've got a $50,000 line of credit that you can pull out of a property. Well, that could be your down payment for the next one. So that's essentially what we've, we've been able to do. And then over time, things got a little bit. So this was in 2015 that we started realizing that you could reduce the equity and you can refinance because there is such a thing. And I'll tell you that, you know, this is why you work with a mortgage broker. The banks are going to come to you and say, this is my, this might be your better strategy. They don't know, like they probably make 40, 50 grand. Um, and I remember talking to that financial advisor three, four years later, and she's like, I love what you're doing. I'd love to hear more about how you like, they're asking me for advice, <laughs> you know, it's kind of weird. So work with a mortgage broker that has their own portfolio and that's able to help people scale up. Cause I'll tell you the financing piece, lender to lender is very, very different. You have to start with the right ones um, or you get capped very, very soon. Um, but over time, and we went from, you know, buy and hold to the Burr strategy. And this is essentially what I, I'm doing right now. But when you're creating equity from renovations and you're taking something that needs more work and you're you know making it nicer but rent ready not too nice because you're not moving into it big mistake people make is they over renovate but just renovate until you get your your max arv the after repair value and essentially you know you're Sorry, can you repeat that just the last sentence renovate until you get to your max after repair value do not over renovate number one mistake people make when they are doing the bear strategy you do not want to have after that, repair value. Why is that so important? That number, that number is going to be how you're going to get your money out. <laughs> so if you're going to be, and then you work it backwards, right? So if you see a, a piece of property, let's just say it's 300 grand and you look at the ones in the area that are actually finished and they're 400 grand. Well, it doesn't make sense to put a hundred thousand dollar rental. If you're only going to be able to, get to the 400 so 300 plus 100 like you're not making any profit in that it's just your money that you're using but if you buy it for 250 and maybe there's a you know thirty thousand dollar reno and you're going to be up at 450 then you're going to be able to refinance so the the lenders will refinance 80 percent loan to value i will say you know there are some properties that i was able to do like a full like i call it like a hole in one burr where you're getting all of your rental money back you're getting all of your holding costs back and you're getting all of your down payment back they're far and few between. Don't wait for that because you're going to be waiting for a long time. Like sometimes I'll have to refinance twice before you get everything out. But if I can um, do the burst strategy, which is buy, renovate, rent, refinance, repeat. If I can do that and pull out all of my rental capital out and then half to three quarters of my down payment, I'm happy. 
Um, and then maybe a year and a half later, I'm going to pull the rest out. And essentially, I don't care if I have like a $200 cash flowing property if I have none of my own money in there. Of no, course, you no. can go to the US. No, don't. <laughs> right, exactly. So I'm like, I'm not spending anything. Like, of course, you like, I, I know this is only like, a, you know, a short show, but there's there's a whole process behind it, right? Because you need to make sure that the, how you're going to refinance, you're going to cover your costs because you don't want to be refinancing. And all of a sudden your property is 600,000 and you've got a, such a bigger mortgage, but your rent isn't only covering the mortgage and the taxes, but you still have insurance and maintenance and stuff like that to count um, in there. So sometimes you'll refinance as a home equity line of credit. Sometimes you'll refinance as cash out, which is a higher mortgage. And you have to know when to do each one because it's going to be quite, quite different. Um, but make sure that you cash flow, right? So like estimate what your property is going to be worth at the end. And once you have that 80% um, new mortgage, let's just say, then is that covered? Um, does your rent cover it? Does your new rent cover it? And if it doesn't, then you might have to do a combination of HELOC and cash out. Um, you know, sometimes I just do HELOCs because I don't need the money. But guys, one tip here, I would say write this down. Get money before you actually need it, right? Unlock your equity before you need it. It's so much easier than if you're like, oh, I have this house, but I have this equity I have to unlock. I'll tell you, I just tried to do a refi like a couple months ago. It literally took me two months because things are so backed up right now. Um, you know, and I, I just like the fact that you're like, okay, if you're going to write one thing down today, write this one down. Yeah, <laughs> when, unlock when, your when equity. You need, when you need money. money. When There's you need no money, to... most people don't give it, right? When you need money, like yeah. most people, it just gets tougher. Get the money when you don't need it. <laughs> yeah. And some you never know what's going to happen. Like you could lose right. your job. Like a lot of people are going to lose their, unfortunately, lose their jobs and, and not have the ability to go out and refinance because they're not going to be able to show that income. Um, but you never know when there's going to be something that you just need the cash for or the next deal. And trust me, like, you know, it's just one of the things that I think I did really well, even from the start, even though I didn't know anything from the start, was I figured out, okay, you know, these properties this past year, they went up like 70 grand. I've got equity. I'm just going to go refinance it. And this is one of the things I would say, go variable on your rates. Um, don't go fixed because it's going to be, especially if this is your strategy is to do the burn, you're going to refinance because you're going to be paying three months in trust instead of a lot more with a fixed rate. So go variable if you're planning on refinancing. And then just like take a look at what your portfolio and if you're, you're the properties in the area have been selling for a lot more and you've got equity in there. Um, I mean, I wouldn't do it for five grand, but like, you know, if there's 30, 40, 50 grand, I'd, I'd consider doing a refi. I mean, you're paying legal costs, sure, whatever. But, you know, if, if you're doing it as a HELOC, you're not paying until you actually need it anyways. Now, what areas are you looking at? Um, and let, let me backtrack for a sec, Sarah. Um, during this time of COVID and the pandemic, are you still looking at investment properties? Are you actively trying to invest? Are you sitting back? I'm just kind of curious. Um, for, for, I actually want to know from your perspective. Well, Simeon is looking for a multifamily for me. <laughs> okay. Awesome. So here's, here's what I think. Um, so what I'm doing personally for, for the single family at this point, I, unless something amazing comes, I don't, I don't think I've seen anything great yet. Like I, I, things are kind of paused, right? Supply and demand hasn't really changed. Um, if anything, if there's going to be an opportunity, I, I can see it after CERB payments are done. And, and I was uh, reading a stat, like 15% of mortgages right now are deferred. So, so deferred for six months, between that four to six month mark, when people are like, oh crap, I have no job to go back to. And my mortgages are coming to you. That's maybe where panic is going to set in a little bit. So I haven't seen like amazing deals. Like, you know, if something comes my way on my lap, yeah, I'm going to go get it. I think at this point in time, I'm more interested in, in doing a burr on multifamily just because the ups and downs of the markets, I mean, really ultimately it's a whole way of calculating, right? You're, you're looking at net operating income, um, the NOI instead of comparables. Um, so what I am actually doing right now, I have a, a burr that I did in Burlington. Um, I'm going to actually try to sell it. And if I can get my price, um, and I can make some good cash on it, then I'm just going to mm -hmm. hold that cash to buy two or three more come winter. Um, uh, but I still am interested in that multifamily piece right now. So, so I would say, you know, plan for a downturn, but also don't miss out the opportunity. So like it's, you know, it's important for me to be taking risk while being comfortable, if that makes sense. Like I, if, you know, my tenants stop paying or there's, there's, that problems, does make sense. 
yeah, cautiously optimistic. I, I love it. I love it. You're cautiously optimistic. And what areas would you only invest in, in like in your backyard? Or are you okay to go out further? Um, like maybe like even out of province or do you only like to stay kind of in your backyard? I mean, I like Ontario um, because I think it has a lot of, of fundamentals like pre COVID. It has some great immigration. It has some great development in terms of transportation. It has, you know, more than one industry, like depending on where. Um, so, so would I look at something else potentially I, at some point I may diversify, mm -hmm. but you know, Ontario is working for me. Um, I don't care if it's in, you know, Peterborough, Brentford, uh, Woodstock, et cetera. So, you know, I'm open to it. I like the fundamentals that Ontario has. Um, and I like the fact that there's such low vacancy in most, you know, the cities. Um, I like that there's also still some cash flow, granted, not like the U.S. So I might, you know, I might invest in the, you know, in the U.S. at some point, maybe when the, you know, the we'll dollar comes back in the winter. <laughs> What's that? Well, right now we'd be paying a 30 cent premium. I know, when the dollar, the, yeah, when the dollar comes months. back. But, you know, I don't think that there's anything wrong. I don't think there's anything wrong with Ontario. I'll tell you, I, I didn't make, I didn't make my wealth with cash flow. I made my wealth with buying low, making the right renos and pulling out equity. That's how I, I, love I it. Be wealthy. Not, not the 200 or 300 or $400 cash flow. Like, you know, so, that's so not going to make has, Can you talk, like you, you, you go off on this all the time. I hear you on phone calls with clients uh, and, and you kind of, there's again that delusion that if it's not cash flowing a certain amount, it's not a good investment. And that's kind of the beginner's myths and the beginner's mistakes where they learn the hard way. They go into a market where the prices have been flat for the last 20 years and are declining, but there's 800 bucks a month, a month in cash flow. And it's the greatest investment. Uh, well, if you're making 200 bucks a year and you just took that income, you're actually paying 43% tax on it or whatever the, the, the case may be. And it's actually the, the silliest thing you could have done because uh, you just burned two or three years out of your real estate investing career uh, for cash flow that you didn't need. Uh, Jazzy, can you go down just that two, three minute stretch that you do yeah. talking about equity investing versus cash flow investing? Well, look, there's, there, there's more, there's more ways to win in real estate with than just cash flow. I, um, I, we like to talk about kind of the five ways that you win. Cash flow is one of them. But we're looking essentially for, and, and Sarah mentioned it, make sure that your rental income covers your expenses, okay? Because And you want to work in the mortgage payment, your property tax, the maintenance fees if it's a condo. You also want to obviously look at repairs and maintenance and vacancy. So make That's sure that important. you're probably, People forget that, right? People forget all that, right? It's not, and I mean, I think even though it's, you know, if it's a home, it's 100, 150 bucks a month. And for a condo, it's like 25 bucks a month. There's insurance as well. Let's get that covered as well. You can find a lot of investment properties that the rental income covers your expenses. But I feel like everyone forgets the other ways you win. You win with uh, passive appreciation slash market appreciation. You win, like my favorite, because it's just a black and white number once you invest is the principal pay down, the mortgage pay down, because that's not happening by me. That's someone else is paying that down for us, right? I and love so that. That's my favorite too, because here's the thing is, is the appreciation, there's going to be ups and downs. If you hold for the long term in five to 10 years, you'll be way ahead. But in the, like, if it's like a one year or two thing too, I mean, we might go, we might see a drop. Um, right. And you know what? I, I don't care because I get the mortgage pay down and I get the cash flow, but the mortgage pay down, like, let's just say you, you invested 50 grand because that's what you put in as the down payment and you got six, five six percent on your money. That's essentially what you're getting just on mortgage pay down is five to six percent on your money. And now if you're using the HELOC for that 50 grand, you're actually infinity in terms of your rate of return. Because it's not your money. Exactly. It's no. not your money. Oh, on I the same it. token, I just want to remind some something because I, I used it the other night. I was doing an investor interview uh, in the intake uh, for a new investor. Uh, and I said, oh, okay, like, your name is this. You do this for a living, et cetera. I said, um, let, let's talk a little bit about your capital. How well capitalized are you? How, wh what are you looking at putting into the market? Oh, he goes, I have about 700K. I said, oh, okay, that's, that's a lot of money. You have 700K in your account? And um, he goes, no, 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 I have a HELOC for 700K. Oh, so first and foremost, your HELOC is not your money. You have access to capital, but it's not your money. 
If you take that HELOC, you borrowed that money. Just like it's a tremendous incentive to say that my return is infinity because I use other people's money. You're also paying interest on that money. You have to be much more diligent when you're using that money versus your own. Because if you lose that money, that has to be paid back. If you lose your money, you've made a mistake and learned a lesson. But the lesson would hurt far more if you had to pay it back and you worked 25 years to pay off your mortgage and you just got into it now. So I just want to remind people to be cautiously optimistic and always remember the fundamentals. Your money is your money. Access to money is access to money. And borrowing is borrowing. Yeah. And always remember those, those very clean lines. And I, and I think... I, the other one that's big that people forget, and, and just to kind of close off the other ways you win, you have the active appreciation where you can actually go in, that, that, that built-in equity go in as Sarah does it, you know, she, she does this very, very well within the Burr strategy is going in and fixing up and renovating the property. But the, the other one that I just know most investors that are listening right now live um, right across all the platforms and, and people that are listening to the recording right now is the tax advantages. So when I look at investing in real estate, I look at it as a vehicle for me to create wealth. And within create uh, wealth creation, is tax strategies. What can I take advantage of? And Seamus talked about paying interest, for example, on that home equity line of credit, but then there's tax write-offs I can take advantage of. There's, uh, um, if I'm looking at if getting $1,000 a month cash flow, well, on the other side, well, I'm going to pay tax on that as well. So you got to make sure you balance it out. Look at the whole pie, not just the cross, not just the bottom of the pie. Like you got to look at the whole pie and see where am I winning? Where am I losing? And then you can, and then you can kind of determine if, um, A, if real estate investing is for you because as Sarah mentioned, the market is going to do this, guys. It's going to go up and down, upwards. But if when it goes down, if you lose sleep and if, you, if you're that person that's going to lose sleep, my, my advice to you by after doing this for 15 years with thousands of clients, and I think the two with me would attest to this, don't do it. <laughs> like, don't invest. If you're going to lose sleep, it's going to cause problems internally in the head externally with family members and so on and so forth unless you're like sarah and you can twist your husband's arm and get him to understand and now he's obviously loving the fact that you're investing into real estate but <laughs> look and and um just don't do it because i think real investors they understand that when the values go down you might want to go buy because it's on sale when values go up great i can refinance and pull out some money from from the bank and start investing with that there is there's going to be so much wealth created by this downturn i think we're going to have a downturn that's just my prediction i don't know how long i don't know how much but yeah. wealth is really created by taking advantage of these opportunities that are going to be coming so that's why you know i i specifically think it's going to be after service is done after the mortgage deferrals come back to you. The other thing though, Jazzy, I just want to mention is when you borrow your HELOC and that's 50 grand or 70 grand or a hundred grand or whatever it is, make sure that you factor in the cost of that payment into your next property that you're using it for that still cash flows. That's true. Cause if it's going to still cost you 500 bucks, it kind of defeats the purpose, right? Yes, I totally agree. Now I, I do sometimes, and I think Seamus was uh, making reference to that as well, because I was speaking to a client yesterday, and um, uh, uh, I, I was telling a story back in 2010, I bought my first place, um, and I was about $100 negative on it, okay, when I rented it out, um, but four years later, I refinanced it, okay, um, sorry, three years later, I refinanced it, so I, I, I put in approximately $4,000 in that three years, but I refinanced it and pulled out $80,000. Yeah. So for round that's numbers. That's totally worth it. And when your tenants and when your tenants move out and you can jack up the rents, you yes, know, and that's, that's exactly actually what where happens. cash flow grows. Is it, it, so like sometimes I've started with like, uh, you know, $200 cash flow and then the tenants leave and I up it 400 bucks. I'm like, sweet. <laughs> <That's the story. laughs> right oh. And the power just went in and out here at the office. It's going in and out. Um, in terms of uh, uh, the cash flow, uh, even if you're putting in, like at that time I was putting in $100, I remember laughing with uh, a CMOS and saying, 
dude, if you and I went for lunch, we spend more than a hundred dollars. Everyone forgets that. Like everyone forgets how quickly they'll spend a hundred dollars. But when it's going from their left pocket into their right pocket, no pun intended with the right club, but when it's going from the left pocket into the right pocket, you, 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 you tend to kind of forget. It's like, no, 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 no. I don't want to put in the hundred dollars. But it's the same person that's spending a hundred dollars on 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 ten subscriptions because they have Netflix, Hulu, and Disney Channel, yada 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 yada, which is fine. But just don't forget the basic the basic concept of investing. That yeah. in the long term you'll be able to pull out this money and you'll be able to reinvest it. And as Sarah and Simos mentioned early earlier, you're playing with the market's money at some point, and that's um, that's that's the best place to be at. Real estate is super forgiving in the long term. So, like, even I love if it. I love that to renovate Thoughts. a little bit, five years from now, you're going to be laughing. Like, you know, here I'll I'll, t- I'll tell you a mistake that if it was my first property, I would probably be freaking out. There's a I think it was number five or six. Bought this property. The attic was like covered. They clearly did it on purpose. And we had a tenant move in. There was like this weird smell. We tried to patch it up. And then essentially they ended up moving out because they didn't want to be there for the rental. So we opened up the attic. There was like vermiculite asbestos. There was black mold. It was like a $20,000 job. That would have hurt if that was my first property. But I will say, um, you know, we bought that thing for two thirty six. dollars um, I'm actually doing a refi on it right now thinking it's going to come in around three thirty, three forty, dollars And it wasn't even that long ago. So a $20,000 hiccup. Like, yeah, it could seem like a big deal, but I think in the overall picture, and now we're renting that place for, you know, um, even more money than that first tenant, um, it is forgiving. Like, I think what where people get, unfortunately, are going to get stuck is if they do buy something and it costs them five or $600 out of pocket, or they buy something that's just too expensive, where the rent regardless is just not going to cover it. Um, or, you know, they buy something with one strategy, like Airbnb, if you buy that and it doesn't work, if it's not an Airbnb, like if it's a, you know, if it's an Airbnb, great, but just have a secondary option. Could it be a long-term? Sarah, uh, like, especially the topic of Airbnb, it's so sensitive to me. You can go, go back to my Facebook so feed it's... two years ago. <laughs> Nothing pissed me off more than, because Airbnb was a trend at the time, like go, going back three years, everybody's buying condos to make Airbnb and they figured out how to all make a thousand or 3000 bucks a month on Airbnb. And all I would say is, please stop calling yourself a real estate investor for the love of God. Cause you're pissing me off. <laughs> Call yourself what you are. You started a business. You're a business person. And there's nothing wrong with that. Steve. Nothing yeah. wrong with that. Right. But what I will tell you is this, Sarah just said, don't buy a piece of property now. Cause it's not about your business of 30 K a year. It's about a property you bought for a million bucks downtown. Guess what happened last November? in Toronto. Bye-bye, Airbnb. The hotel association lobbied your ass out. You can no longer run an Airbnb in Toronto, period, unless it's in your primary residence, a room in your primary residence with asterisk, 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 and the dog can bark on Wednesdays, and on Saturdays you can (laughs) go feed the grass. Get the Get out of here. Get out of here. So but it's going to have- be unfortunate because that I think that's where a lot of people are going to lose their shirts right now. Um, in- they are losing their shirts. They put a glut, almost 5,000 condos are returning to the market as we speak. Right now, Toronto has never had a, te- a tenant market. Never. In my entire real estate career, 15 years, not once since I moved, since I moved to Toronto in year 2000, I have never had the upper hand on my landlord. Right now, in the epicenter of Toronto, because of Airbnb, there's a tenant market. It's not going to last because Toronto's going to absorb it. But at the end of the day, people don't think ahead. And those are the people who make the mistake. They're not thinking, oh, this is the only strategy. Well, what if something changes tomorrow? What am I going to do then? How am I going to carry it? I make 45000 a year. My, my, my husband makes 45000 a year. My wife makes, my sister, whatever, whoever you invested with. You're not, you're not bulletproof, bro. And real estate is one of the only asset classes that can make you bulletproof if you play your cards right. Bulletproof. Especially as, as Sarah mentioned, how forgiving it is. And if there's one thing nobody wants Simos and Jazz to do is lose our shirts. It's not a nice sight. No. Um, so make sure that, <laughs> make sure that you're, 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 you are protected in a location, in a location that 
and Sarah, you put it perfectly, in a location that you have other options. It's actually quite basic, right? Like in, in anything, just make sure you have some other options if you're going to go down that Airbnb route. Um, I, and I, I do love Airbnb, but yeah. it's, not, it's not good in every single market, right? So like for me, I Airbnb this cottage right now. And because of the ban, I'm enjoying myself. I have a cottage with a nice water view, but you know, I, I can rent it for a very short period of time to cover all costs. That's right. Um, because I bought it super cheaper than I, I you know, <coughs> what I needed to do. But I, I would not do an Airbnb in Toronto, like there's, or Mississauga or Oakville, like unless I had the property. So I'd probably Airbnb the Oakville house I have if I decide to move out of it. Um, but I wouldn't, and I know you're like Oakville has some, some policies, you know, with that too. But I wouldn't buy something in those markets to say, I need $5,000 a month, but I'm going to get it from Airbnb. And that's my only strategy. Cause to me, that is high risk, like investing in real estate, believe it or not, like it's, everything has risk, but I actually don't feel like it's that risky in comparison to the stock market in comparison to even cash sitting in the bank, right? Like have some cash sitting in the bank for the rainy day funds, but you are not building wealth. If you don't take that money and, and figure out what to do with it to create more, more money. Simos, if you don't mind, only for the sake of time, and we have, you know, we have Sarah here, she's just uh, full of like a wealth of knowledge. Why don't you start queuing up, my man, uh, a couple of the questions I see, uh, like a lot in the Q&A. Well, uh, yeah, well, there's, a, there's a lot of really good ones. I was actually just looking at them a second ago. So Sarah, we're going to start rapid firing kind of questions sure. at you. Right. I know you're yeah. used to it. You're going to be able to handle it. Um, while you queue that up, um, Sarah, question, real quick question for you. For somebody who's listening right now, how do they how do they ha- get access to funds? Like if the bank said no, what's, what's some, what's some uh, uh, strategies that someone can take with them today where they can actually get some access to funds? So if you, if, so let's just say you don't have your property. Cause if you have a property, I would say right. a mortgage broker and get it from, from there. Chances are you have some, um, if, if you don't, I would say, okay, so there's a lot of people right now, like myself included, I have um, transferred my RSPs as an example to, um, community trust or Olympia trust. So you can actually, um, arm, non arms length. So not family or blood related. There's a lot of money out there that people don't want to be investing in the stock market. And they don't even know that you can invest it in the first or a second mortgage. So I mean, I've just literally last month loaned out 50 grand to one of my students, um, at 9%. And I didn't charge points. Like sometimes there's points, sometimes there's, but there's a lot of money out there where people have- points, points are actually a broker or lender fee on top of the 9% is what yeah. Sarah is referring to. Yeah. But that like, talk to each other, talk to your friends. What are like, what are they getting in terms of return? Could you offer them even 6% instead of their 2% that they're getting? Cause here's the thing. If you have a 6% mutual fund or somebody's invested in a 6% mutual fund and there's 3% MER fees, uh, that's 3% and inflation is 2%. You're making 1% when you break it all down. I would rather <laughs> take my money in RSPs, transfer it in RSPs and say, I want to get 9%, 10%, 12%. 50. It depends on who it is and what the deal is. But you you have that control to say, I want to loan out my money at this percentage for the, these terms and get paid at, you know, within whatever interval that you, you deem. Of course, there's like criteria. But that's awesome. And there's a lot of people that have that, that money and they don't even know that's an opportunity. So even just talking to them about how they can do that is, I think, huge. Um, there's a lot of money lenders out there. There's mortgage brokers that have access to money lenders. Like a lot of people will go and say, can you find me a deal to invest in? Um, And then just market, um, you know, network with people, hopefully, you know, connect. This is a great time to connect with other investors that you might've met. If you have something that they don't have, like maybe you can hold financing, but you don't have money. I can tell you, I'll take somebody that can hold the financing, maybe, you know, give them a, a percentage of a deal and put gladly put the money in as an example like you know me personally i kind of looking for something different but you know when i was first starting out if i needed the money or I, I needed the financing and i didn't have one or the other partner jv it's better to jv than to do nothing but if you can do it by yourself do it by yourself that's the yeah, people definitely have a tough time understanding that jv is better than nothing uh and and this is one of the our oldest uh, uh sayings and, and action items is one uh, percent of a hundred pies is a lot better, not only than one whole pie, but no pie at all. 
So getting those small pieces and then, then being diversified with different partners, not only are you going to grow because you have a piece in, in, an, in a rod in, in the fire, you're actually going to meet more people, see more opportunity and have the opportunity to do more deals. You're going to grow because of others. Others are the only way you grow. So it's, I was going to say, and if you have built the experience being the JV, the money partner, the financing partner, you have experience. Now you can take your experience and you can go to somebody that's brand new and be like, look what I've done. And then they're going to be your JV partner of, you know, putting the funds and putting the financing in place. And there's, there's many, I mean, there's many ways to do it, but I would say like money is not that hard to find because it's just a matter of what cost, right? Are you paying 15% on it? Like there's businesses out there and they, they just, you know, loan out money. There's um, uh, Blackjack Contracting. He's partnered with a, a financing company that will finance up to $100,000 for construction. Like there's, there's money out there. I don't know what the terms are. Um, I'm guessing it's going to be expensive, but there's opportunity. <laughs> the money is not the hardest part. Find the deals. I would, I would tell you at this point in time in, the, in this market, maybe not in six months from now. This and, to, and to anyone, Sarah, that wonders like, why would somebody pay 15%? The, the reason somebody would pay 15% to someone and it makes a whole lot of sense is what if you located an opportunity that has a whole lot of meat on the bone, meaning that a property that should have been sold for 350, you picked up for 250. Well, now you have a lot of meat on the bone. There's a lot of baked in equity that you can bring in money at 15% instead of using your own money, right? So, so yeah. you notice how much there is a market. You ever notice how much we talk about food on these things? <laughs> Just like it's okay, like, okay. I will say, I will say about food. I want to talk about food for a second. Okay, the best thing I'm doing right now because I'm I'm at the cottage, so, so my chef isn't coming every single week like she was. No, I found this amazing catering company, and like you guys could probably look into this. And they bring you trays of food for the week, and it's like a fraction of the cost. I don't have to go to the grocery store. I don't have to prepare anything. Like the next best thing to having like a chef that actually comes and does your groceries and brings you stuff to your house is finding these catering companies. And I will tell you right now. They're looking for business because they're not doing weddings. They're not doing events. They're not doing any of that stuff. And it's like the easiest, best thing ever. What's the company called? Well, this one's in Peterborough. So it just depends on, on where Got you guys it. are. Got yeah. it. Actually, our Find director a catering of company, guarantee you're going to, you're going to. Our, our director of sales and marketing, Laura Stewart, she, she, she does, she's hooked up with one of those as well. And she does about, um, uh, I think it's like six, seven meals and it's all kind of catered to specifically her needs and what she's trying to accomplish, uh, you know, in the next couple of months or whatever. And, and, and it's actually very caught, like it's, it's quite effective in terms of costs, but there's no time that you need to put in. So it's actually, you know, gets right delivered right to your door. It's the best thing ever. And you know what, we need to support local because at the, at the end of the day, we need to be more, in my opinion, right. I don't want to preach, but yeah. I'm going to be more conscious about where I'm buying my stuff from and who I'm supporting because of, you know, like we, we have to, we have to make sure like Canada is based on small businesses. You know, we just have to support sure. each other. And I know it's like crazy times and this and that, but I'm going to think twice before buying something that comes from China. That's for sure. I love that. I love that. Simos, let's go, my man. Let's throw some rapid fire questions. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of really good questions, guys. Uh, let, let, so when I, we say rapid fire, Jazzy, this goes for you. Sarah, this goes for you. <laughs> no tangents. Uh Answer Seamus, the question. Seamus, so we can, can you look at yourself in the mirror and say, Seamus, this goes for you no, as well? I'm the one asking the question, so I don't have to be included in this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the next. worst guy, but that's why you have me asking the question. Oh, we bring, bring, bring in Bobby. Bring in Bobby. No, 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 no. Let, okay. Let's keep it close. If you ask me a question, I'm going to be the culprit. <laughs> go. <laughs> All right, go. Um, Ready, fire, aim. Go. Ready, Love it. fire, aim. <laughs> Is the right club a full-time business for your team, Sarah? No, we have hired, I am a master delegator, um, you know, over time I've learned that skill and it's helped me work on the business. So we have Catherine, we have Paul, they work on it pretty much full time. We have some VAs as well. Um, so it is a business that we spend time on, but definitely not a full-time thing. Awesome. For me. Uh, our good friend, Art Raposo, long, long time client. And I can definitely say a uh, friend. Uh, is asking, Sarah, do we need to sign up or can we just show up to a right meeting? If you go to the rightclub.com, um, there are webinars. You can sign up for those. That's what we're doing online right now. I think the next one is on Wednesday. That one is more, is not as real estate specific, but it's all about mindset and, and that kind of stuff. So that's going to be good. If you go to the calendars page, then you'll be able to just register and then you'll get the, uh, the link. And uh, usually they're on Wednesdays at seven. Awesome. 
Uh, Tyler Walburn, who's uh, our our guy, he's our um, uh, director of concierge, and uh, and and he just copied and pasted in a question probably from the chat. Um, this goes well to, to both of you guys. Can both pipe in? It's a good one. I want to refinance uh, the new property I bought with hard with a hard money lender. Uh, the banks and mortgage brokers have said no to me because it's an Airbnb, and they all want a long term rental. So they're not looking to finance your business, my friend. And they're looking for you to put invest uh, to put rental stock into the marketplace. So that's why they're saying no to you. I tried to, to rent it as an executive rental because he's looking for higher cash flow, obviously, but I didn't get anybody. What will you suggest? So this guy clearly needs a solution. Uh, what can we tell this uh, this uh, gentleman or this uh, lady to do? Because we don't know who this is. That's a really good question. Do you want do you want me to take this, Jazz, or do you go, want to? Sarah. Go, Sarah. Go, go, go. Okay, so lenders My guys hear me speak all the time. They want to hear you. Trust <laughs> me. You got a way, and you got a way better voice. <laughs> oh, this, this is a great right, question. But, well, you can add anything that you want afterwards, but I will say you're right. Lenders do not like Airbnb income, they will not count it. So what some lenders will do is they'll look at like what the average like regular full term um, tenant would pay for. Um, something else is that it could be counted as a secondary home, depending on what it is. And some lenders will look at it differently. So work with a good mortgage broker that is able to help you scale. Um, and then the other third solution, um, I can't recommend off uh, on air right now, but you know, you just need a lease that's signed. Love right. it. Um, I love what you said that. about, <laughs> like, I don't know the location of this. Um, so I, I, j just to try to add uh, more value and context to the whole, uh, to the whole group that's watching and listening right now, um, ask more people. I, like you said that you've asked uh, uh, some lenders and some hard lenders said, no, get to a more independent mortgage broker. He or she deals with over 500 lenders. You've just heard some no's. You will get a yes. It's just a matter of asking, and you might need to pay a little bit more. Um, I'm, I'm just going to add one sentence, only because this could be uh, a bloodbath. Uh, it is a serious question. Uh, in, in this one, if it, if this is what's happening, this person is for sure hurting. Um, <clears throat> if you are in Ontario, whoever you are, Tyler, go back to find out who it was. If you are in Ontario, please give us a call. We'll make some recommendations to some brokers locally that we know uh, are very creative. Uh, and we trust them dearly uh, and see if they can help you. Uh, if you're in an outside market, please pipe into Tyler. He's our air traffic control. He's our director of concierge services. He will locate and, and, and source uh, a few proper options for you to take a look at. So if you are hurting out there, uh, you know I'm not a big, a big fan of Airbnb. You should have called me before. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Uh, but uh, if you're hurting, call us. Let's get you fixed up for real. Let's do the yeah, there, there are lenders that will just like assume if it were to be rented long term, what it would be. And so just work with those ones. Awesome. Uh, Sarah, question for you. What's your strategy for content in the podcast? From Mitch Premisar, who is an avid multifamily investor, real estate investor, uh, great friend. What is your strategy for your content on your podcast? I don't know if I have a strategy. I just like to interview people that are doing it, that have done it and um, that are as Canadianized as possible or ha can have content that can apply to Canada. But ultimately, at the end of the day, I mean, I, I just want to make sure that I, I get facts and I get insights and I get, you know, tips. Um, I just don't, I don't like to interview somebody that's like very salesy that has a program that they're going to, that they're going to want to sell. Um, but I, I don't think I have a strategy per se. I mean, I, I release one a week. I'll tell you, I batch them right now. I've recorded up until October. So everything that you're hearing now has been pre-recorded. I'm taking a pause. I like to take my summers with a little bit less of indoor stuff. So I record them and then they go through the summer and then I, I'll start again in October, November to, uh, to batch record again. So strategy, I mean, I just, I will tell you that, um, you know, my goal is to find the best people to come on the podcast and kind of switch up the, the topics over time. But I, it's uh, not like I have this mastermind behind the podcast. I just kind of ready, fire, aim them. <laughs> so I, I personally have, this kind of raises a question for me, uh, Sarah, because uh, you, you look at life conveniences, mm -hmm. uh, meaning you look for good pricing on food that's ready that you don't have to take uh, time up cooking. You, you batch do your podcast so you can take your summer off. Um, you're an investor, you're an entrepreneur, uh, and you're a, a woman in leadership, uh, which uh, means a lot to me. Like I, I respect that very much because there is 
uh, many very strong women around me uh, in our business uh, and around us. I just adore it and I find it uh, fantastic. Um, what drives you? Like, do you, are you looking for uh, balance? And like, what is it you enjoy? You enjoy some just some clean time off. Like, how do you live your life? What's your what, what's yeah? Your I mean, so a lot of people don't know this. I actually still work full time. I was leaving. I was about to leave in April. Um, I absolutely love my job. I love my boss. He bought like six or seven of his own properties because totally bought into the real estate game as well. So I have the best team. I have the best boss. His wife was really sick. She passed away. I wasn't going to leave until then. Um, and then I was going to, I was planning on leaving or going down to part-time in April, but then COVID happened and now I'm working from home. So, um, I, so I will say, you know, ultimately I want to do this a short time and then I want to be a snowbird. I want to be able to go back and forth and avoid the winter. I want to have, like, we all have only one life and I'm not saying that I'm perfect because sometimes I I'm so overworked, like even before COVID, like some days I just, you just go and you go and you go, and then you don't have time to pause. A benefit for me of COVID, even though there's unfortunate things that happen, it, it helped me reset a little bit and just take that time back and be like, this is why I'm doing real estate. It's not for the, you know, brick and mortar. It's not for, oh, I have this much wealth, but it's about like, okay, now how do I turn this into a life that I want? Because I'm only going to be healthy for a certain amount of time. I mean, you know, you're, you've got one life, you never know what's going to happen. Um, I just want to live it while, while I'm still young and healthy. God bless. Awesome. I'll move on. That was just, that was me asking and it's uh, awesome to hear that, uh, that you're looking to live your best life. That's, uh, that's amazing. Um, Ken LaCroix, uh, what about her very first purchase? Did she put 20% down? Uh, I was paying attention and yes, she did. Ken, <laughs> she, she did put it together. So I will say though, like if you don't have 20% and you want to move into it, move into it, you can do 5%, 10%. I think CMHC is looking at moving that up to 10% at some point. You might want to yeah. talk to a mortgage broker, but there are ways to get in with less. And again, there's people with RSPs out there uh, or registered funds that can help you as a second, cool. second mortgage position. Uh, Susan, Besk, uh, Susan Beck uh, is asking, uh, please your comment on investing as an individual versus uh, a legal uh, a cor a corporation. Uh, what do you recommend? At what point would you switch from an individual investor to a corporate entity? In Canada, it's not a one size fits all. Usually when you start, you're probably going to have in your own names, but um, you're going to want to talk to your mortgage broker, your accountant and your lawyer and realize and figure out what the reasons are for or for, for not doing it. Um, some lenders will not give you as favorable terms if you're in a corp. So it makes more sense to go um, in your own name, just get really good insurance. But the, the benefits of the corps are not like the like be all and end all, right? So like, again, just like, like figure out what the benefits are. And, and sometimes you'll realize that it's just, it's not worth it because the tax filing for the corpse and doing everything like it can eat all your cash flow. Um, I, I will say one benefit that happened for me because I have some with corpse and some without. And this is not a one size fits all again. It could, it could work for you and it could not, but the ones I have in corpse don't show up in my credit report. Leave it at that. Nice. <laughs> yes, we will. Yes, we will. That's a good advantage, I guess. Uh, it, it, let me say this guys, uh, for creative deals and creative financing, uh, again, networking is the only way that you're ever going to get real conversations uh, and methods that people are doing that may or may not be uh, something that they're comfortable in sharing in front of a recorded audio uh, in, in audience, but uh, they may be very comfortable in telling you in person. I'm, I'm happy if anyone wants to connect with me afterwards yeah. with more, more details. I just got to be sometimes careful of what I say publicly on recording. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, look, there's always, there's always loopholes to things and, and, and every situation is different. And so just make sure that you reach out, reach out to us, reach out to Sarah, yes. reach out to everyone that we bring on brunches. Um, and you'll know that again, there's loopholes, but it's not a one size fits all. And the um, loopholes you want, you want to make sure that you're doing it with as much integrity as possible anyways. Like you never want to be caught for this stuff, right? I mean, like being like not, you know, there, there's certain things that I would never touch. And there's some certain things that I'm like, hey, this is not like horrible, but just, just you know, trust and integrity comes first. If you don't feel right about it, don't do it because that'll come but you. Nobody here is alluding to mortgage fraud, guys. <laughs> we're, 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 talk, we're, we're talking yeah. about if you need to, 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 to put a couple of I's and cross a couple of T's to make it more favorable to you. We're not talking yeah. about uh, madness. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. 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 No, um, no fraud. Quick, yeah, quick, quick question from Johnny Lombardo. Uh, do I go with a 25-year or 30-year? Like 30-year amortization obviously is for a better cash flow or should mm -hmm. I be sticking to 25-year, Sarah? 30 Every time, always, no always. matter 
Why? Because it's gonna it's gonna hurt your your de uh, debt to income. It's gonna hurt everything that you know the bigger payments that you have. So at some point you can pay it off faster. You don't necessarily have to just you know pay it off at year thirty, but it's gonna be in your best interest for so many reasons. I know we don't have a whole lot of time, but just do thirty years, twenty percent down. Don't put more than twenty percent down if you don't need to. Good for you. Love it. Uh, which uh, Mitch Premisar, uh, Mitch man, how many questions, bro? <laughs> Hey, we brought in. We brought in Mitch guy. We brought in Mitch live. Mitch is live. taking over he's the Q and A. <laughs> we brought him in live, and now he's caught the bug. Yeah, he's caught the bug. Shout out to Mitch. Mitch uh, all right. What happens when you have to unlock equity as a second or third mortgage at a higher rate? I wouldn't do a third mortgage. Um, I would Would do you a sell the property? Place. If at that point, you, if you need third mortgage on a property, is it at some point in the day that you just say maybe it's time to get rid of this one? Yeah, likely. I, I'd have to know more about the situation. I can't really give a, an answer without knowing more, but third mortgages are just so expensive. I wouldn't do it. All right. Uh, Sarah, are you going with the short-term mortgages? Uh, okay. So when you're doing your refis for your burrs, uh, what kind of term are you picking? Are you picking a two-year, three-year, five-year? What are you doing? I will usually hold them for... Um, so basically a five-year term, as long as you're not going to sell it, you might as well do five years or, I mean, you can play around with it. I usually do five years and I'll do um closed and i'll do variable nice 99 of the time excellent thank you uh jazz do you have a comment for that is there a favorite strategy that you do no i i, I like going variable you look at uh you look at the time in terms of um you know the last 15 years variable has always kind of won out uh, compared to fix in terms of term in years i actually even look at 10 years sometimes there was a last year there was like a, a 10 year closed even a, a close rate at uh i think we were getting it at like 2.8 percent or 2.9 percent then you're fixed, then you're fixed. I, I, I think I, you know, I think so long term when it comes to investing that um, I, I've done a, a property at a ten year as well. Yeah, and when you've got the the mortgage, just keep in mind there's variable and fixed. That's one thing, and then there's open and closed. That's another okay. thing, right? And then you can have a combination of all of those. I usually don't do open because the rates that means that you can pay back at any time. The banks are going to charge you more, so I'll do closed. That means I'm going to keep the property for that amount of years. But variable, you can refinance at any time. Fixed, just essentially you're not going to, or it's going to cost you more money. Awesome. That, that's a great answer, guys. Thank you for sharing. Uh, can you explain the less than 20% down? Uh, do you work with multiple realtors on one team? I'm just trying to see if I can combine. Mm -hmm. Let's get a couple of more. We, uh, he, we, here's we, one. We, we, uh, we've kept Sarah indoors a, lo a long time right now. So let's get to a couple of... Awesome. Here, I'll show you guys. I don't know if you can see my view. Can you see my view out here? Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Hi, oh my God, look at that. <laughs> It's good. So she's not suffering too bad. She's not suffering. <laughs> um, th this is around uh, your process and your team, uh, like building your yeah. actual, uh, the, the people around you for investing. So M M Mitch was saying, do you work with one, uh, one uh, realtor or multiple realtors? Uh, and Candace is saying, how did you build your team? What was the process like? Who are the key players on your investing team? Realtors have to be local because I will not get the same team. Okay. So the easiest way to build your team, I mean, I've, I've done it over time and I've yes. learned it the hard way. Cause I wish I had somebody to help me in the beginning. The easiest way to build your team, I'll tell you is just find a realtor that is an investor that is an investor in the area that you're interested in and use their team. And then you can upgrade it over time. That is the easiest, best way to, to do it. Cause I, so here's the thing is, is Simeon, you're awesome. But I wouldn't use you if I needed to go and find something in Timmins because you probably don't know that market as an example. Correct. Correct. But, you know, so my Brantford realtor is local. My Hamilton people are local. My Peterborough person is somebody different. Like they're all different because it's important for me if I find something in Peterborough, I'm like, hey, I need your handyman. I need your plumber. I need your, you know, all of those people. I don't have time to like vet them. I'd rather use your team and then I'll upgrade them as needed. Um, but the core, so that's, that's going to be your local team. So local teams, make sure that your, your realtors are investors and they're doing it themselves. Um, super mm -hmm. important, especially in the strategy that you want. And then your core team is going to be like your mortgage broker, your account, your lawyer, like they can go across essentially Ontario. They could be the same person. Um, your paralegal again should be local in my opinions because they're going to be in the courts and I use a check, like part of my like really long screening steps is a check with my paralegal. And if they're not local, they're not going to know who's in the courtroom. Um, so there's all these things. I would say your team is the most important. I would have not been here today if I didn't have a good core team and then local teams. 
um, and start with one area or two, but don't go all over the place just because then just gets a lot more complex. Like my, my portfolio, I mean, it takes a couple hours a month for me to, to manage it. Um, it's not a full-time thing. You can definitely do it even with a full-time job on the side. All right. Well, 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 thank you. Sorry. Go ahead, uh, Jazzy. I was just going to add, like, even from our perspective, um, you know, we're obviously talking a lot about investments and investing into real estate on our brunches. But myself and Simos, we uh, manage a team of 33 realtors that also part of the 33 realtors, about 22, 23 of them do the regular real estate, helping somebody buy their first condo, smart size into homes, um, uh, something into a home that's bigger and a condo that's smaller. And it's why our team kind of spans right across the GTA because there's so many micro markets. Sarah mentioned it. Like we probably wouldn't be the guys to deal with when it comes to Timmins. We'll know somebody in Timmins, but we're not the guys in Timmins. I don't even know where Timmins is. So I, like, <laughs> you're, gonna to, you're gonna have to tell me where that. Like I'm so GTA central, born and raised here. But you might be selling your home in Brampton and buying a condo in downtown Toronto. And within our team structure, it might be two, two different realtors because our Brampton, we have an expert in Brampton homes and then we have an expert in downtown condos, two totally different markets, right. the, the supply and demand, how you sell, how you, like, it's everything. so different. So I, love the fact, I love the facts there that you mentioned about making sure that uh, uh, not only do you stay local, that the realtor is investment savvy. Yeah. Cause, cause you want them to run the numbers before they send you like, what I hate is people that send me crappy properties. I'm like, you didn't even run the numbers. Like there's no opportunity. So <laughs> I'm wasting my time <laughs> looking at you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> guys, um, I, 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 right before I have, I have one last question. Uh, it's from a good friend, but before I get to that very last question, I have a huge important announcement. Everybody that's on this brunch this morning, uh, next brunch, almost certainly is going to include a really hot release in the 416. Um, it's going to be a, a pre-con uh, uh, opportunity in the 416 at under a thousand bucks a foot. I've been working on this for over two months. It's finally coming to fruition. The developer got their Terry on number. Their zoning is in place. Everything is done on the checklist. So uh, I, I, the only reason I can't say anything about it is just in case there's any last flinches. And and just right. to add to that, Simos, that's yeah. that's the project that, um, uh, w you know, we get about 50 projects at our table every single year. We only get loud about 10 to about, call it 10 to 12. Yeah. Um, and this is the one that we've been waiting for. Yeah. Uh, in fact, we've pushed away other projects that have come down, uh, uh, like down in our funnel to make sure that this is the one that we want to uh, release that's and right. uh, I'm glad that you brought that up because I'm so, very- So if excited. anybody is kind of trying to make a comparison, think uh, from last year uh, opportunity, think Treti, think Nordic, think Lynx, stuff that you bought that has yeah. already made over a hundred bucks a foot, meaning like you're on track to do 30, 40 points a year. It's that type of inventory. Um, I am negotiating to get a minimum of 20 to 30 units. I'm trying. Even if I end up at 15, that's a lot of opportunity for our audience. So- Guys, stay tuned on that. And now I'm going to the last question. And this is specifically a question to Sarah. There's no weaseling out of this one. The question is by Justin Conacow <laughs> from London, Ontario. JK. How? How? He misspelled it. Justin, bro, go back to school. <laughs> Who is the best looking panel on Zoom right now? It's herself. <laughs> just joking it doesn't have to be between us it's us he's saying who's the best looking panel on zoom right now and it's this one right here sarah i want to i want to thank everyone who joined us today thank you thank you thank you so much on all the platforms sarah to you um just a huge thanks for everything that you do, not only for joining us today, you put out a lot of content, you put it out for free. It's uh, one of my favorite, favorite things to watch is you just being you. And so thank you for that. Can you please leave our listeners with one tip? It could come from a mindset perspective. It can come from a strategic, like right from the, in the micro of investing into real estate, but please leave our guests on brunch with REC with one tip and or strategy. Yeah. One, one tip is hard, but I, I will try to, you know, 
give you one for today is we're in a time right now that we're kind of stuck inside. People have more time than they normally do. So reach out to a real estate investor or somebody that you want to connect with before things get back to normal and start making those connections, start building your network and start really a, you know, getting out there. If you're not networking, um, you know, this is your, your first step to change your life. But I'll, I'll tell you, like for me, I used to work some crazy hours, not for the real estate investing part, but just like everything else I'm doing. And I have a little bit more time now. So, and, and probably you guys too, right? It's not as busy. Start, start connecting with people that you might not normally because they, chances are they'll likely respond in times like this and you'll be able to build those connections. Awesome. Um, really quickly, just before we wrap up, um, leading up to this opportunity that Simos was mentioning, um, you might want to take, for everybody who's watching right now, take advantage of what thousands of others have in the last 15 years, which is our real estate action plan. That's where myself, Simos, or someone from our senior team will be in touch with you during the week to talk about, it's kind of a, a financial checkup from the neck up. If you go to recanada.com forward slash real estate action plan, Tyler, if you can put that in uh, uh, the, the comments here, it's recanada.com forward slash real estate action plan. That's where, again, myself or Simos will take the time or someone from our senior staff will take the time to go over what you have in your portfolio now, what are your goals, and how could we possibly uh, uh, achieve the objectives that you're looking into doing in the next year, two years, or five years. Take advantage of it. Thousands before, uh, before uh, have as well. There's th hundreds of insiders on this webcast today that have also taken advantage of it. And that's how we'll take you through step-by-step step, hitting some of those objectives. You bet. Sarah. Um, Thank you so much. Absolutely. And if there's any questions that people still have, they can email me, Sarah at sarahlarby.com. I put it into the chat, um, awesome. but uh, feel free to reach out. You can also go to the website. There's a contact me page, Sarah Larby. We're, we're going to also send it out, Sarah. It's going to be going back. It was on the email coming in. It's going to be in the email going out for anybody who missed it. There is no doubt people will have the opportunity to get in touch with you. I think you bring a lot of value. So a huge thank you for me as well. Uh, Thank you. You guys, you guys are awesome. You know, keep up the great content. It's always uh, fun. It's always engaging. You, know, you guys are hilarious as well. So I, <laughs> I, enjoy, I enjoy doing this. Like it's, it's good energy, you know? And so thank you for everything that you guys are doing. Cause I think it's important to be able to, to give back so that that wheel keeps turning, right? Somebody that's new that got this content is going to hopefully turn around when they're a little bit more experienced and do the same awesome. thing. From Mississauga, so Ontario, I want to say thank you to the REC nation. Thank you to our Right Club Nation. Thank you to everybody who tuned in. I know I want to give a quick props to Ryan, one of our colleagues, Jacob, one of our team members who just uh, performed a uh, hole in one burrs, as uh, Sarah was saying. Uh, <laughs> Ryan did it out in Hamilton. Ryan Coyle, Jacob Campanero, you did it up on Lake Erie. Um, congrats. Uh, and everybody, thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here with us today. Thanks, guys. Thank Take care. See Thanks, everybody. Week. It was fun. Thanks for awesome. all your great questions. Bye. Bye, Sarah. Bye.